Thanks to Skillshare for supporting this episode of SciShow Space. The first thousand people to click the link in the description can get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership. There is perhaps no bigger issue facing humanity in the 21st century than the climate crisis. Scientists now know with certainty that human industrial activity is the primary driver of our warming planet. To fight back, we're gonna have to take big actions, like eliminating the use of fossil fuels, stopping deforestation, and shifting to more sustainable agriculture. Or, you know, we could just move the planet just like a little farther from the sun. No big deal. This idea has been floated, I think, disingenuously in the vaunted halls of the U.S. Congress, and we're not going to do it. But I am curious, would it work? And would it be possible? To answer those questions, we need to understand how Earth's orbit affects its climate. The idea that changes in our planet's orbit are connected to changes in the climate is something that scientists have been studying for more than a century. Our modern understanding of their connection dates back to 1911, when Serbian mathematician Milutin Milanković began comparing the timing of past ice ages to the position and orientation of the Earth. He identified cyclical patterns in Earth's orbital parameters that spanned thousands or even tens of thousands of years, what scientists today call the Milankovic cycles. Three factors in particular have long-term effects on Earth's climate. The first is changes to our planet's eccentricity, or how elongated its orbit is. If the planet's orbit were a perfect circle, Earth would receive the same amount of sunlight all year long, but instead, that orbit is a little bit squished, meaning sometimes we're closer to the sun and sometimes we're farther away. Right now, the difference between that minimum and maximum sunlight is a mere 6 percent. But due to the gravitational pull of Jupiter, and Saturn, sometimes our orbit stretches out enough for the difference between minimum and maximum sunlight to reach 23 percent. And this isn't exactly a year-to-year -year variation. The cycle from most circular to least circular takes about 100,000 years. The second factor is Earth's obliquity, or how tilted its axis of rotation is. Our planet's tilt creates the seasons, not its distance from the sun. The more tilted we are, the more extreme the differences become between the seasons. That tilt varies between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees, and a cycle that lasts 41,000 years. And finally, last, we have our axial precession, or how wobbly the planet is as it rotates. This varies over 26,000 years and is responsible for how balanced the seasons are in the northern and southern hemispheres. Thanks to precession, summers are hotter and winters are colder in the southern hemisphere, but in 13,000 years, it'll be the north that experiences the more extreme conditions. Taken together, the Milankovitch cycles help explain why Earth's history is marked by a seemingly endless pattern of frigid ice ages and temperate interludes. But what they cannot explain is our current period of global warming. Remember, all of these cycles take tens of thousands of years to complete. A lot of the effects of climate change are being felt over a mere century or so, which is a blip on the Milankovitch timeline. What has changed in that time is the scale of human activity and the amount of heat-trapping pollution we have released into the atmosphere. And that brings us back to this fantasy of moving the Earth just a teensy bit farther from the sun, which, again, is not going to happen. But the Milankovitch cycles tell us that our orbit does affect the climate, so it seems like it could theoretically work. As you get further from the sun, the intensity of sunlight drops off rapidly, as a function of the distance squared, in fact. So a relatively small change could have a meaningfully large effect. Now, scientists aren't sure how much Earth will warm in the 21st century, but the best estimates put that number between 1.5 and 4.5 and and degrees Celsius. Now, to fight back against the middle of those estimates and cool the Earth about 3 degrees Celsius, we would only need to move our planet about 2 percent farther away from the sun than it is today, which is a mere 3 million kilometers. And accomplishing that is a lot easier to say than do. Astronomers have thought up a few possible methods, but none of them are what you would call good. We could detonate a pile of strategically located nuclear bombs, basically vaporizing parts of the Earth's surface to push us in the opposite direction. That would take 500 years if we could drop one bomb every second, day and night. Now, in that situation, Earth might end up in the right place, but there probably wouldn't be much life left for it to matter. Also, that is so many bombs. Instead, we could shoot a laser at the moon with the power of every wind turbine currently operating in the U.S. And that would push the moon's orbit out from the Earth, which would drag the Earth farther out with it. This would totally work, 
if you have 300 trillion years to wait. So we need another option. How about snagging asteroids and slingshotting them around the Earth for a gravitational boost? Unfortunately, even if we did this with every asteroid in the asteroid belt, it would only get us about a quarter of the way to where we need to be. And also, then there would just be no more asteroid belt, which isn't very much fun. And if one of those bad boys hit the Earth by accident, could be game over for us. So we are left with one option that makes sense, and that is to leave our planet's orbit alone. Obviously, the negative effects of any of these other ideas and the amount of effort are just mind-meltingly more than sorting out our greenhouse gas addiction here at home. Sure, changing the way we live, work, and play will be a big deal, but it's a good bit better than 500 years of unending nuclear explosions. At least that's how I feel. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow Space, which was supported by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. If the idea of our changing climate has you feeling a little bit anxious, you might enjoy the Ultimate Self-Care Playbook with none other than Jonathan Van Ness. But there's also plenty of new courses launching all the time, ad-free and curated especially for learning. If you're interested, the first thousand people to click on the link in the description can get a one-month free trial of premium membership. So thank you for your support. <laughs>